Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Greetings from CES 2016. Coming up on Tech Thing, Alexa, turn on my Ford autonomous drones, gorgeous screens, amazing audio, badass Wi-Fi routers, gaming laptops that can kick ass, and beer printers, and more. It's all coming up on Tech Thing. This episode of Tech Thing is brought to you by Lenovo. I'm Shannon Morse. I'm Patty Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we make technology behave. Except this week, where we just gawk and stare and covet things that we can't afford or are actually afraid of. And we watch, well, actually, look, there's the RealSense Intel enabled uh, drone, the autonomous drone. It really is Skynet. <laughs> We'll talk more about that little guy in a moment. We're here at CES 2016 in Las Vegas, Nevada. We've been here for pretty much the entire week. We started out with the at and Hackathon, at and 24-hour Hackathon last weekend. We've been going on to the shows. Right now we're in Intel's booth, and uh, we want to thank Intel for letting us use the space. OLED, one of the big themes this year, where we're actually seeing a ton of products, probably the craziest, most forward-looking one, uh, LG's 18-inch screen you can roll up. They've been doing private demonstrations of that, like literally like roll up. They claim they can get this uh, screen up to 4K resolutions. Um, OLED LED TVs, LED TVs, <laughs> 4K TVs. Robert Heron's going to talk about those in a couple minutes. Um, Dell had a gorgeous, the like new flagship 30-inch ultra sharp 4K monitor, which covers the entire Adobe RGB gamut. It's like six grand, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, man, it's been crazy. It has. Yeah, it's it's been nuts here. We've seen so many things, but we'll give you our top five. Well, my top five. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, yeah, it's funny. We've seen the refrigerator with a 21.5 inch screen in the front running a Tizen operating system. We've seen so many drones. So many drones. But why don't we start it up with Robert Heron? Let's talk about pretty screens and 4K Blu-rays. I'm staring longingly in the distance at like a 70 foot high ad for Samsung's ad wash. There's the, the porthole and adding in the children's underpants that they leave in the bathroom. Genius. Best invention at CES, possibly. Robert, my partner at AV Excel, Mr. TV, I'm going to call you now. Or do you prefer Mr. UHD TV? Or Mr. 4K. However, however you prefer. There's a lot of good technology as far as if you're interested in televisions, projectors, screens different shapes, curved, flat. There is something here you will find just absolutely amazing. We, we got a launch date for Ultra Blu-ray. LG's got these gorgeous OLED TVs. What's your favorite thing at the show so far? It would, it would have to be OLED. I mean, it, once you take a look at that technology and its ability to produce that exceptionally dark black level, and it gives you the wide viewing angle that a plasma television offered, that combined together really brings it together. And it's, it's so compelling once you see it. Add to that the new ultra high definition Blu-ray that's coming out. Pre-order now, start availability coming in March. 30 titles announced. There's going to be probably several dozen before the year's end. Now we have the highest quality source content paired with some of the finest display technologies. The ultra high definition alliance. That may, yes, it's an alliance, but having that stamp now on your set indicates that you're going to have a level of performance that's pretty much going to take you forward going with these technologies like high dynamic range, wide color gamut exceptional brightness, the ability to do a very well contrasted picture and represent that video as intended by the director. It, I mean, it's unbelievable to look at the high dynamic range, especially on the OLED TVs. Um, at what point should somebody, I mean, is, is 4K pretty much going to be ridiculously affordable by the end of this year? Without a doubt. If you're not looking at supporting the latest feature sets, like if you want to get the full experience from this new high definition Blu-ray, ultra high definition Blu-ray, you're going to need one of the latest sets that has that ultra high definition alliance seal of approval if you're looking at the super premium. Otherwise, look at what Vizio did with their M series for last year. That's some of the most affordable 4K technology out there with solid panel technology and an LCD system, a full array local dimming. A few manufacturers are actually bringing affordable local dimming to uh, more models. And hello to you too, gentlemen. <laughs> cohorts, ex-cohorts, or no, still cohorts, anyway. But uh, one of the things though that LCD will have an advantage of over OLED at least, is if you're dealing with uh, maybe a slightly bright room where you need all the light output you can get. LCD is still gonna maintain the absolute epitome of light output for a while. Uh, almost double the light output technically of what an OLED can currently do. However, if you've got any kind of room light control at all, that's where the panel technology is kind of even out, and then it swings back more to the OLED side of things. But you know, when you say room light control, you mean things like curtains? Curtains, or, or you're not dealing with strong like sunlight flooding the room type scenarios. If, if you are dealing with that, if you're the daytime TV viewer, 
you want all the light you can get. And you're probably still going to look at LCD technology. Also, LCDs are incredibly, generally speaking, way more affordable than OLED. OLED is still going to be the premium display technology this year. LG is still pretty much the only manufacturer going to be providing panels to the United States market. We've seen other manufacturers showing off OLED panels, either for the European markets in the case of Panasonic. Panasonic's got one of the most beautiful OLED TVs I've ever seen in their booth, but apparently that's only going to be for the European markets this year. Some of the Chinese manufacturers here, which are coming into force, companies like TCL, uh, Hisense, and others, uh, they are showing off some of their own technologies, either related to LCD or OLED as well. I'm curious to know who the Chinese manufacturers are going to for OLED panels, or are they developing their own technology? I mean, it's funny, because we originally saw TCL and Hisense, they kind of got into our face originally by incorporating Roku as the interface for video playback. Um, the Tizen stuff that Samsung's coming out with, where they're basically like, okay, we're going to stop shoving this crazy interface in your face, and we're going to try to make it easier for you to get to the stuff you want to watch. What? You could, Samsung really only introduced one television at this show. They have other models coming out later in the year, but in addition to what they were really showing was what the new model could do. And that new interface really is a step up from what they were doing last year. And I'm hoping that this will be applied to some of the models that came out last year as well. The main thing is, is you're no longer going to have to click like three or four times to dig into what either the content or the channels you're looking for or the features within the TV. That interface now is more dynamic and it keeps everything right in your face. So maybe one or two clicks rather than diving deep into menus to get it either your favorite app or your favorite show or something you recorded. And also, I'm seeing all the manufacturers paying more attention now to universal control. And they're doing it in some unique ways. They're, they're really striving for an auto detection system. So you plug your, your, your Blu-ray player, your other products, your game console into your TV, and then the TV can sense what that product is, set up all the control interfaces for it, and then that one remote control you have that it was included with your TV will now drive your cable box, your satellite box, your game console, everything. While we're talking about remote controls, uh, I think it was Seven, perhaps the most sophisticated, stylish, like it looks like it fell out of the West Elm catalog, but actually looks like it has a tremendous amount of performance underneath this very slim, sophisticated remote control. It was a surprise, actually. We were at a, a, at a show, off show, off-site show, and uh, it's either Savant or Seven, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but this was a well-done remote, color touchscreen, beautiful display, but the interface and the capabilities of it. Harmony, arguably, is the big daddy when it comes to universal control systems. What Savant was doing a little bit different was, if you really want to drill down to a button doing a, a very specific function, they made it so simple with a mobile app paired with the programmable remote. You could do things like, maybe you've got a relative or a family member who really only watches like three channels. You could easily set up those three channels as completely independent buttons. Uh, you could then tie that into Internet of Things, like you want the lights to dim at the same time and other aspects like that as well as just the ability then to control a variety of devices easily. So put that together in a very compelling package. The remote quality felt great. There was no creaking. Design was solid. Software looked great. I'm happy to see more people getting into that space as well. And, and, and in many ways, I felt their interface, the user interface, was even more clean than I'd seen from any offerings from Logitech currently at least on the remote side. Well, it's funny because there's nobody's really come anywhere close to doing anything that challenges Logitech. The only downside is that you're probably looking at about $500 just to get on board with this new remote control system we saw. Anything else exciting? Uh, any non-TV stuff you saw and just went, I want the thing? Well, uh, it's not a TV, but a projector. I was over at the Optoma booth, and they have a prototype 4K LED projector, uh, which is, oh, it was LED. It was LED. They, there's a combination of laser projectors here at the show and LED projectors, and their LED projector should be relatively affordable. There's a new single chip 4K chip out of uh, Texas Instruments that everyone's going to start using, but they were showing good brightness, excellent picture quality. I think it was a 120-inch screen. And even in the prototype phase, where literally it's like a box hanging in the air with all the parts hanging out, image quality was fantastic. And, and that RGB LED system, that provides epic color saturation. So going forward, if they wanted to ensure that's compatible with, say, ultra high definition Blu-rays, wide color gamut standard, LED is likely to be able to do that. Because uh, you, you can do very saturated, you can bend a very saturated blue LED, a red LED, and a green LED to create an imaging system that can produce fantastic uh, picture quality. The benefit, though, really, of an LED in a projector is longevity. They, they claim 20,000 hours. I haven't really seen anyone find one yet that's failed. So they're, they kind of are conservative in the fact it could be twice that. And, and that's, you know, that's 
a decade of use. At, at two hundred seventy dollars a bulb to five hundred dollars a bulb, I'm down with twenty thousand hours. Totally. And you, given how lamps change over time and that affects image quality, uh, LEDs eliminate that problem, and it makes it a more robust system in terms of shockproof and other things like that. You shouldn't be bouncing your projector anyway, but but still, uh, that was pretty cool. And beyond that, I'm trying to think. I, I saw a preview of some upcoming display technology that was really cool. Nanosys is the company that does quantum dot technology for many display manufacturers, including Samsung, TCL, and others. They showed off to me, well, currently, if you don't know anything about quantum dot, it's basically a way to, you can use a blue light to stimulate a quantum dot to produce another color of light that's super pure, super controllable, super accurate, great for doing extra efficiency or extra brightness or extra color saturation. But instead of stimulating that particle with light, they can stimulate it with an electron and then create an emissive display like an OLED or a plasma. And I have yet to see that, even though it's technically possible. But when I was visiting with Nanosys privately in their booth, uh, they pulled out a device, hit the button, and I saw an emissive OLED material right in front of me, uh, electron stimulated. They said about 12 months from now, we're going to see a prototype display. So I have a feeling this show next year, we're going to see some competition to OLED starting to be born. You pretty much have written up every TV here on the show floor at? At HeronFidelity.com, baby. So you can check it out there. <laughs> and guess what? Uh, just a quickie, Sharp Electronics is back. Hisense purchased them. I just had a preview. They don't have a presence on the floor. They're offsite a little bit. But the TVs I saw were all full array local dimming, LED systems, lots of zones in terms of the backlight control. Pricing was superb, 4K resolution curved screen designs, flat screen designs. I can't wait to see what they're going to do because they were the grandfathers of LCD production and development back in the day. First 1080p screens, first large format screens that were affordable. And I, I, it's good to see them with a new owner who are going to take that brand and hopefully run with it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Heron from HeronFidelity.com and AVXL.com. Go check it out. Let's go find out what Shannon's been drooling over on the show floor. Look, anybody who says CES is dead hasn't actually been trying to move through the floor and the hallways <laughs> at CES. So true. Yeah, it's a debacle trying to get through here. It's kind of like a maze of people, yes. and you have to be a ninja to actually get through. And sometimes you got to hit, hit people with your tripod. I mean, just saying. <laughs> I witnessed no tripod whacking, although <laughs> I'm certain I saw people thinking about whacking people with their tripods. Netflix, by the way, their big keynote at CES 2016. Netflix is everywhere, like 130 countries. Um, everywhere but China, North Korea, Syria, or the Crimea. They've got Arabic, Korean, simplified and traditional Chinese, uh, and further languages are in development. Wow. So Net That's crazy. It's crazy. They announced a couple of series. Um, which I won't even get into right now because the the you know, basically one's about like the young life of I want to say Queen Elizabeth and the other one's about the development of the disco culture in the Bronx. <laughs> if memory serves, and I was talking to Tom Merritt uh, on on Daily Tech News Show, and he's like he wants to see those two cross over in the worst way. And all I've been able to do is 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 see Queen Elizabeth in a full 70s disco ensemble in my head for the last two days. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. <laughs> So moving on, we also got some news about the Oculus Rift, which we actually have a price point for the new one that they are releasing. $599, it's gonna show up March 28th. Pre-orders now, and I believe the pre-orders are being filled in the order they're made. Original backers are gonna get it for free, and remember, you need a GTX 970 or better on the desktop, and a GTX 980, I think, is recommended. Yeah, I know a lot of people were upset about the price point. They thought 600 is way too much. Uh, I guess we're just going to have to see. We're going to have to see how it actually works. I mean, see it in real person. Unfortunately, they had their booth very closed off. You had right. to stand in line for a couple of hours to actually get to demo it. So we didn't get to demo it, but I'm hoping that we, we will get one in. I believe Darren backed it, so maybe we can just steal his. If not, I have a friend who does things in VR. It's been We're going to actually get a couple people we know who are heavily invested in VR uh, to get in to talk about it, because I really think if you aren't dealing with it regularly, it's yeah. enormously difficult to make an intelligent judgment about how finished it is. Although I will say, you know, Minecraft. It's all going to be about the Minecraft. And the other thing that shows up in every new technology that I'm not talking about on a family-friendly <laughs> podcast like this one. I think it's time for a rapid fire round. 
where we've got three questions, three reviews, three awesome things in under three minutes, and Patrick's got it this week. Are you ready, Patrick? Because ready. this is brought by Lenovo. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, go. So I am down with 100 fan companies, uh, home kit ready ceiling fans, and there's been so much Wi-Fi as always at CES, but we're talking about speed right now. MU MIMO is coming, along with a lot of gadgets that claim to secure your home network, but seriously, I just want to talk about speed. Ignition Design Labs, they're going to do a Kickstarter later this year. Um, the Portal is their new router. Take a bunch of Qualcomm and Broadcom engineers, have them look at open wireless spectrum, and you get a router that claims to deliver unprecedented speed in crowded environments like your basic crazy neighborhood in you know, New York City or San yeah. Francisco, or most suburb, like suburban developments. They're claiming they're going to use all the spectrum available if uh, it's available if you use uh, dynamic frequency selection and actually coordinate between the portals in the same hood. I'm, you know, condensing greatly, but it's an interesting idea. And there's really only been a couple of routers uh, like Apple's Airport Extreme we've seen with any use of DFS frequencies whatsoever. Right. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, D-Link's DIR-891 router and uh, DAP-1655 Wi-Fi extender bundle. These are the crazy sort of red robot crown routers we've seen from D-Link, but this new one's really cool. The extender comes in the box. It's a fairly powerful extender. So there's a, there's a big red crown and a little red crown or alien or dead spider or whatever you want to call it. Um, and they link up automatically. This, the management looks really, really seamless. So they did a demo where they took a Skype and they walked it way the heck out into another room and far, far away. And you watch their management software show you when it transferred to the extender. They say it's going to handle, you know, one extender will come in the box. Additional extenders will be available if you have a big old house. Um, looks good. 470 is not cheap, but it can handle up to eight of these extenders. And it looks like the management is going to be much more seamless than a lot of roll your own things we've seen. Three. <laughs> Speaking of speed, while there are a ton of solid $100 AC routers coming this year, we'll get to those later in the year. Uh, I was kind of enjoying seeing a Linksys EA9500 Maxstream AC5400 tri-band router. It's a great example of what we're going to see at the high end this year. 5 gigahertz plus 5 gigahertz plus 2.4 gigahertz, 4x4 AC, uh, multi-user MIMO, USB 3.0, dual-core CPUs, 8 antennas, more specs than you can shake. It's 8 antennas at probably overkill for most users, but really, really curious to look at. I'm curious to see what the speeds look like in my house full of horsehair lath blaster. And finally, four, because CES is a week of excess, uh, the Asus XGD2008. It's a 10 gigabit switch. We've had a lot of you like, when is 10 gigabit going consumer? This is pretty cool. There are 10 ports on it. Only two are 10 gigabit. The other eight are gigabit. So it'll allow you to sort of, it'll act as a switch in between the 10 and the, and the gigabit. No price, no release dates. Uh, and of course, you know, you're spending a couple hundred dollars to buy a 10 gigabit card right now, but it sounds like 10 gigabits finally going to sneak into the home this year. Sneak. Ah, I'm so excited. I really want to know the price point of the 10 gigabit switch. That's going to be, that's going to be what sells it or what may, makes people very, very sad. The phrase lots comes to mind. <laughs> Although, I mean, it looks, it's, it's a silver box. Yep. Actually, you just saw the silver box. Anyway, we'll get more detail on networking gear all this year because we know we keep getting Wi-Fi questions and speed questions, and we'll try to get you, uh, as we start getting hands-on with more of this gear, how it works. I found so many amazing things here, but unfortunately, if I wanted to talk about all of them, I would have you guys sitting in my kitchen for 24 hours. I, I would be I, sipping sweet tea as we talk about them. <laughs> Sipping sweet tea. Did you find anything of interest in the sort of beauty and fashion pavilion over at the Sands? I didn't even go over there. <laughs> didn't you though? Did you find any beauty expertise for me? Oh, you know what I did see? I saw two different products for hair growth, which was so weird. <laughs> they look so 1950s, like back of a cereal box, send in this thing and we'll light your head on fire. I, I, I... <laughs> they really do, yep. You had picks. I do. So I have five top picks. All of them are from kind of different genres, but all centered around technology. And I took notes. So my first pick is the Illy Wearable Translator. So this is a gender neutral necklace that you can wear whenever you're traveling to different countries. They're very much touting this is for a traveler. It's not to you know decrypt what other people are saying to you in different languages on a day-to-day -day range for like general conversations. It's for travel. It's not the a babble fish. It's not a babble fish, exactly. So the reason why it's just for travel is because it has a proprietary travel lexicon inside it, which means it has its own library and it doesn't requ requ 
require a connection. So it's not going to have every single word that you would generally use, but it'll have most of the ones that you would use for travel. So maybe if you say, how much does this cost? It'll be able to translate that. Um, may I order some tea? It would have something for that. Where is the restroom? Stuff like that. The first version is coming in English, Chinese, and Japanese because it's made by a Japanese company, which is great because I'm going to choose Japan in May, so I really want to check it out. No price point yet, but they do say that it'll be releasing in spring for pre-orders. I'm very skeptical about this because of that no connection. I'm really curious about how it's going to be able to deal with, you know, diction, right. how you s actually speak and how it different parts understands. of the country, what it sounds like. Exactly. So, yeah, that's the Ely Wearable Translator. And my number two is called the Prevoro Privacy Smart Guard because, you know, I got to have some privacy up in here because, you know, that's my thing. So the Prevoro Privacy Smart Guard is basically a phone case and it's just for iPhones at the moment. This is supposed to block camera, microphone, and RF, which is radio frequencies, which is the most adaptable way for like government agencies to be able to track where your cell phone is. That's how GPS works. That's how a lot of different frequencies work, including cell phone calls and everything else. So this case enables you to block not only that, but microphone and camera, which hasn't really been done yet. Now the unfortunate Oh, what's that? I was going to say, it's really crazy because it basically snaps down over, I want to say, all four microphones on, yeah. on the iPhone and then plays a set of, you know, like a whole range of frequencies to yeah. literally just jam it with sound. So they, they tout that it's 110 plus decibels levels of RF protection, which is right. pretty much the highest that you can get currently on a consumer market. They did tons and tons of testing. I even offered to take this to DEF CON and they were very adamant about me doing that, which I totally, totally approve and I really appreciate that they're open to hackers right. testing their equipment. The unfortunate part is they are selling this for a thousand bucks. So it's really geared toward companies right now that need to protect the data that people are using on their iPhones. I'm really hoping that they will release Android versions. I'm also hoping that the price point will go down as they get more and more popular. So we will see. I'm going to keep my eye on Prevoro, and hopefully they'll let me bring one to DEF CON because I think that would be awesome. <laughs> the terrible, yeah, that'll be, I, I, it'll be fun. Just put it on a stand, let people try to invade it and see what happens. So number three on your list. So this one is very much gaming, and it's with Sony, Sony PlayStation 4. Uh, this was a demo that I saw, and I thought it was the coolest thing. Uh, they had a man behind the scenes, and he was just with the press, and he was playing a game called the London Heist, I believe it was, and it's supposed to be released later this year. They were using this thing called Project Morpheus, which, as you know, now is PlayStation VR. So you have a VR headset, and you have the PlayStation Move controllers. He was able to play the game standing up, Oh, moving wow. around, ducking behind things, standing up, using the move to trigger, to reload his gun, to like push it so you could get ammunition shooting out of your gun. It was very, very cool because as he was doing this, you could see his exact movements on a television as he was doing it. And it was very, there was no lag. Right. It was very quick, very fast paced. I didn't see any issues between what he was doing and what I saw on the camera. So it looked like he was totally winning. It was awesome. Now, this wasn't just a demo, though. This isn't just some proprietary thing. This is actually going to come out on the market later this year in 2016. They don't have a price point yet. I'm really, really hoping we'll find out about the price soon because I kind of want a PlayStation 4 now. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the coolest VR I saw here. That was my favorite, like that I personally got to see with my own eyes, and I really, really liked it. <sighs> <sighs> We're waiting on our HTC Vive demo. Soon, soon, my friends. Number five on your list? Number four is uh, another demo that I saw here, but it's actually going to come onto the market in 2016, is Intel's RealSense camera technology, which they're not only implementing into drones, which was my favorite part, but also different kinds of gadgets for other kind of specs as well. So this was really, really cool. It's the drone that just landed right over there after staring at us through the fence. I've been like watching it behind <laughs> the camera. It's so cool. I do have a ton of B-roll that though, so I, I will show you exactly what this thing was doing. I liked it because this uh, this thing called the Unique Typhoon HUAV, that's the name of the drone, it's going to cost under $2,000, not an exact price point as of yet, but it has this really cool technology built in with the camera, and it's a 4K camera with this real sense technology that does collision avoidance yeah. and it can chase you down <laughs> 
so my first thought when I saw this thing chasing a guy around his arena was I could take my drone for a walk. Well, that's like one of the demos. They had a, a ton of de demos in Intel's keynote. Uh, a bunch of them using Curie, which is their small, low-powered mobile processor, where they're they're using it to sense athletes' movements in real time and, and identify, say, BMX tricks while they're being shot on a ramp. Um, in the case of like the unique, they had this crazy, you know, the the mountain biker is going, and then the drones chasing him, the mountain biker, and then a tree falls, and the drone avoids the tree. But they also did. They they sent a couple people down to Baja, and they actually used the drone to follow their mountain bikes on a trail. That's just so cool. I mean, I'm not really sure how I would personally use it on a day-to-day -day basis because I don't need a professional drone. I don't need it for collision avoidance. <laughs> I just want to walk my drone, and I think that's cool. <laughs> well, you can walk your drone now. You want your drone to follow you around yeah, you like a Praetorian yeah, guard. Right. <laughs> right. I could put it on a leash, or I'm sure I could just control it from my phone, but I love the idea that you don't even have to control it. just auto follows you. It finds the target, and it follows you, and that's yeah. kind of creepy, but awesome. <laughs> One of a number of really cool real sense demos we've seen here. And that brings us to this time I will count and hold up the right number of fingers. Five. Number five. So this is two products that work together. The first one is called the Razor Blade Stealth Ultrabook. So this is going to have a starting price of 999 bucks. It's an Ultrabook, but you can also use it for gaming if you want to. How so, does that work? <laughs> so it's I'll give you a few of the specs. It's it's less than three pounds, so it's really really lightweight. I was able to pick one up, and I was I was very, I was very excited about how light it was. So definitely an ultrabook. It has a Core i7 6500U processor in it. So of course Intel. It also has uh, eight gigs of RAM, and you can get it for up to uh, I believe a 512 SSD inside it too. So it does come with the the SSD card. Now it does have integrated graphics in the laptop, and those are the Intel Gra HD Graphics 520. So you can play, you know, a Candy few Crush. games on it. You can play Candy Crush, sure, you know, things like that, which is kind of weird coming from Razer. You filled your soda. <laughs> and it does have eight hours of battery life, so decent battery life, not the best I've seen on the market, but it'll last for a full work day. Uh, last thing, though, that is really cool about the Razer Stealth Ultrabook is the fact that it has Thunderbolt C built into the USB-C connection. So this is going to give you the ability to do Thunderbolt, display port if you want to, all sorts of different adapters will work with it. All it took was an external toaster sized box that'll hold a full bore 3D gaming card for <laughs> Shannon's song of rage and anger on USB Type-C to change. Shut up. <laughs> so the other part, part two of my top fifth pick is the Razer Core. So this is the external, it's kind of weird. This is one of the first external graphics enclosures that we've seen and it, and it looks awesome. And I was able to play Fallout 4 on it and it really worked. So this is called uh, the, the Razer Core. It's USB-C and it does have the Thunderbolt 3 on it as well. And it accepts double wide graphics cards from pretty much any of them. So it's not just proprietary to NVIDIA, not just AMD. You can do either or as long as it's PCIe and it's the correct size, so correct width, of course. You know, if, if it's too long, it's not going to fit, obviously. Uh, this thing has four USB 3.0. It has Ethernet in it. It also has HDMI. The one I was able to check out and demo with Fallout 4 had two HDMI set up with two different monitors and the laptop as well playing Fallout 4. I was very, very excited about this thing. Not only that, but it also has you know the fancy lights and everything that Razer does with all their cool tech. And the laptop, the Razer Stealth, that thing has the full RGB keyboard too, which is the first laptop that has done that. So I was really, really excited to check these out. I'm very much hoping that we'll get one in for review very soon. Shannon was talking about it for the better part of 18 hours. Shut up. Well, it, it's cool though when you have like a you know a sub three pound ultra portable that you can turn around, go home, plug into a big ass monitor, and play serious video games. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, one of my favorite things at the entire convention, and I was I was really excited to take it home, and play some games. <laughs> Are you excited about something? Got a question for us? Ask at TechThing.com or tweet at TechThing at Snubs or at Patrick Norton. Will be well. We're actually not really going anywhere, but I have picks. Can I do my picks? You can do your picks. We'll be right back. So I got to spend a lot of time with the Sands, there's 3D printers, I saw some fitness devices that 
some look practical, some look somewhat less than practical. Uh, medical stuff is starting to get really serious here. Uh, but for me, I think, I, well, you know, I'll just get to my top five picks because there's been so many shiny objects and I'm still staring at shiny objects right now. And I still like, I want to go into the Ford booth. And I want to get the latest Hoonigan because because Block builds rocking cars. And I want to race through the hallways at CES in it. Um, <laughs> Can I just skip my flight and go see the Ford booth? I, I really, I'm interested in seeing that whole Alexa thing. It, it's a pretty interesting idea, the integration of, of Echo and Ford. Of course, Chevy was here with their new actual, like, you know, 200 mile range Chevy Volt EV, which is going to be, I, I think, 30, 30 grand after about 7,000 in, in subsidies. Um, it's a, there's a lot of, there's so much stuff. Like, automotive manufacturers have pretty much taken over the North Hall at this point. Um, in any case, uh, one of my favorite surprises here, a company called ELAC, the Unify UB5 uh, bookshelf speaker. Um, about three years ago, Kef came out with the LS50, one of the most unbelievably beautiful sounding bookshelf speakers I've ever heard. And they don't sound like bookshelf speakers. They sound like big, fat, honking, just sit in front of them for the rest of your life speakers. Uh, a lot of the audio geeks I know, everybody is like, those speakers are amazing. So Andrew Jones, who's uh, been a speaker designer forever, seems to have a vengeance against expensive things. So he looked at these speakers, or maybe he didn't look at these speakers, but I look at these speakers and I see somebody who wanted to build a $2,200 pair of speakers and turn them into a $500 pair of speakers. And it's, wow. yeah, no, they, they sound like I walked in and I'm listening and it's like, so, you know, what I, I didn't realize it was Mr. Jones up there and later on I went all fanboy on him, which probably <laughs> creeped him out. But Mr. Jones, I love what you do. Um, but it, it, there's this beautiful, I want to say something involving, like it was like a quartet, right? Beautiful spatial sense of the instruments hanging in space, all that gorgeous audiophile stuff you go for. And then he's, you know, you know, and the cello was really good. And I asked if he was using a subwoofer, and he said, No, now let me play you some Dead Mouse. And he throws on some Dead Mouse, and all of a sudden the room is rocking. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, Wow, because these are not particularly big speakers. In any case, uh, they're a three-way bass reflex monitor. The tweeter is actually centered in the mid. He, ba he pretty much designs all custom drivers for all of his speakers. A shocking amount of bass for the size, super clean, tight bass, 500 for the pair. That's a quarter of the price of my former speakers I desperately want but can't get. But I can actually probably get these speakers. If that sounds too expensive, um, uh, Elac and Jones just designed the debut series, which is all involving all custom monitors. They didn't have any setup to listen to, but we're looking at about $229 for a five and a quarter inch uh, their bookshelf speaker. And they also have a full range of, uh, uh, on the debut, they also, uh, they have center channels, they have subwoofers, they have full size speakers, uh, and they have the ability to do um, uh, Dolby Atmos. They have a pair of Dolby nice. Atmos speakers too. Um, Elac's more audio centered, although they do have uh, a, a uh, center channel speaker available for those. No subwoofer yet, but I don't think they actually need them. The Falsetto Link, um, Samsung's SSD T3 is really cool. It's basically Samsung taking an 850 Evo and putting it in an aluminum enclosure. Falsetto's Link, uh, they call it a storage platform. It's like tactical uh, wannabe seal gear meets portable storage. Uh, it's aluminum, it's ABS, it's like under two by two by one inch, 250 gigabytes to two terabytes of storage, a quad-core CPU, uh, Bluetooth 4.0, 802.11ac, 4x4 dual pan, Wi-Fi. They say it'll operate uh, at 45 feet underwater. Apparently, they left one at the local YMCA and ran it for like a day and a half. Um, it's supposed to have 10 hours of battery life with its onboard rechargeable battery. That is going to be anywhere between, I want to say, 349 and 1400 or $1,500 for the two terabyte version. Yeah, pretty pricey, but still solid state drives at two terabytes. Are are, they're are quite pricey. expensive. And the thing is tiny. I was interested in the fact that they built this on Linux, uh -huh. which is, I think, pretty yeah. awesome. Uh, and I asked them about encryption, and he walked me through the encryption. So it sounds like a legit device. Yeah. It sounds pretty cool. And they claim they can support up to 20 users simultaneously. But if you have 20 users moving data to it simultaneously, the battery life is going to drop. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was I'm, I was like trying to think who's going to use it and what they're going to use it for. But it's an interesting idea, and I'm kind of curious to hear the stories. Number three, AudioQuest Dragonfly Black, Red, and Beetle. Um, essentially, they're doing a new $99 affordable DAC, a new $200 the Red, which is going to be high voltage for big, heavy, honking headphones that the original Dragonfly had trouble driving, and the Beetle, which is a Bluetooth DAC uh, for people that want better audio. And it'll handle all those will handle like 96, 24 bit audio. Um, those all looked really and sounded actually one of the best. They had those playing through about a billion dollars of stereo gear and a pair of watt speakers. Uh, 
which was heavenly. Uh, beer printers, I'm sober, but these were amusing. The Pico Brew, which uses Pico packs, uh, like big slide-in boxes, and it'll brew beer in your house. And the Brewy, which uses Brewy pads, which are like sacks of the material you need to make your beer. Uh, I just find those highly amusing. Both of them are on pre-order right now or for sale right now in the like three to five hundred dollar range. And uh, Samsung's AdWash, seriously. Uh, the Family Hub fridge and its 21.5 inch screen is amusing. I, like its screen and its speakers and its camera that'll take pictures to let you know if, if there is mustard on the shelf or not. That's nice. But adding things like having a porthole in the front of your laundry machine so you can throw in that pair of socks that your kid left in the bathroom, awesome sauce. I'm not even joking when I say that Mr. Patrick Norton over here has talked nonstop about that ad wash washing machine. I swear, I swear to you, I have heard about this thing at least five times a day and I've been here with him since Friday. So that's like five days of hearing about this thing. You're all about the Razer gaming laptop and apparently I'm all about laundry, which is probably because my son's been sick for three days at home and my wife's done eight loads of laundry. I have laundry on the mind. What do you have on your mind? Go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash tech thing, and tell us to stop talking about gaming laptops and washing machines. <laughs> Hey everyone, I just wanted to remind you that you make Tech Thing possible by supporting us over at Patreon at patreon.com slash tech thing. Because of you, we were able to come out here to CES. We're able to bring you the news straight from the show floor, so we really appreciate everyone who contributes to the show. Of course, if you want to, you can always go over to patreon.com slash tech thing. You can donate however much you want, or you can just share the show with your friends and family and everybody else who you think would want to see what's happening at CES 2016. So thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. We truly appreciate it. Yeah, without you, we can't make this happen. So thank you for making it possible. More things we want to test out after attending CES 2016. Do you want to start with your first pick? <laughs> sure, yeah, Bitdefender box. I saw that one. We saw the Asus MG line of 4K monitors. I saw another thing that's a competitor to the Bitdefender box called the Kujo. <laughs> lots and lots of security boxes, like Just physical boxes made for box consumers. And protect your home network forever. It's like a physical firewall, pretty much. And I, one of them just happened to be a fan of Hack 5, too. And oh, I was cool. like, oh, good. Can I bring this to DEF CON? <laughs> I don't want to know what the answer was. Uh, the Ecobee thermostats, remote sensors, Luma Mesh networking, Sennheiser's HD800S, amazing headphones, and Ambio 3D immersive audio. Never expected Sennheiser to start working out their own immersive 3D audio technology. That's pretty cool. There was the uh, Parrot Disco drone, which is literally the first consumer drone that I've seen on the market that is an actual drone and not a quadcopter. <laughs> uh, Pioneer's new head units, Intel's Curie chips look amazing. Monoprice uh, has a $199 3D printer and some gorgeous 21 by 9 displays. Uh, Acer's upscale $179 Chromebook. Lenovo's ThinkPad X1 tablet and productivity module. That's not a sponsored mention, by the way. Um, so much we can't fit it all in one show. So, so much. So, of course, if you guys have questions or if you say, hey, did you happen to see yada, 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 you can always email us, ask at techthing.com, and we'll make sure to answer all of your questions on next week's episode when we get home to the Bay Area. Yeah, we're going to sort a few things out, uh, kind of, because there's a bunch, of, we both had like a pile of things we wanted to talk about and didn't fit in, and of course, uh, we'll be demonst demonstrating, we'll be reviewing a lot of the products we talked about at the show today as they are released throughout the core of the year. Apparently, this is the universal sign for as they are released. Be free. <laughs> be free products and come to Tech Thing to be reviewed. I was just thinking, should we give them an analog pick of the week? I think it should be go to a convention that has nothing to do with technology. <laughs> I've found a place outside of the hotel where I cannot hear a slot machine. Really? Where is that? Yeah, okay, you have to show me later. All right, we're we're gonna we're not gonna leave you here forever. I'm Shannon Morse. I'm Patrick Norton. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. Bye.